Okay, finally to step four, which is probably why a lot of you actually thought you were coming today, and that is developing your estate plan. What documents do you need to have drafted? I, we're gonna talk through four tools that I think everybody needs to have, regardless across the board. Everybody ought to have a will, a durable power of attorney, a healthcare power of attorney, and an advanced directive. So let's walk through each of these four documents. The first one that we're going to talk about is a will, and I think everybody's pretty familiar that a will is just a document that decides how property is going to be distributed at death. Um, you know, I will tell you there's different rules from state to state on what you have to have in your will and how wills have to be executed. Uh, the other thing I'll say is I know that you can go to Google or to Office Depot and get a will that it says is for Texas for $29.99. Don't do that. Uh, I can't tell you the number of issues I see pop up in those wills where they're not suited to the situation or they don't actually follow the law of the state. It's just problematic. And listen, I told you you got four documents you need to have. I'm going to tell you that you can do three of those for free if you want to. The will's the exception. So this is something I would pay an attorney to do. I would use a lawyer to draft that will. I promise you, whatever you pay on the front end is going to be substantially cheaper than what your estate will pay if there's a problem on the back end. All right, so that's my spill on that. Uh, keep in mind, we talked about this, there are some assets that pass outside the will, right? Those things that are non-probate assets. So the important thing to remember there is the will doesn't control everything. And you'll hear people say sometimes, well, I left everything to my wife in the will. That's great for what that controls. It doesn't control everything. And so I really recommend you need to take the time to go investigate your beneficiaries for anything that you may have those designated for. We'll talk about a case in a minute that'll give you an example about why that's so important. Uh, for your will in Texas, it can either be handwritten or typed. It cannot be verbally spoken. We don't recognize uh, those. For a typewritten will, it needs to have two witnesses. They don't need to read the will and know what's in it. They just need to witness you signing it, right? For a handwritten will, it needs to be completely in your handwriting. A couple of things to consider when you're looking at wills. One of them is you want to try to have a self-proving affidavit. What that is, it's just an uh, affidavit where you lay out, you know, my name is Tiffany, I signed this will on this date, and you get that notarized. Now, let me just be clear. The will to be valid does not have to be notarized. It needs the witnesses. If you have this self-proving affidavit, that does have to be notarized. And the benefit of that is when you go to court to probate the will, that self-proving affidavit is admissible in court to prove that you signed it instead of having to go down and get the two witnesses to come testify. All right, so it can just save some time and effort there. Um, it needs, you also may want to think about having what's called an independent administration clause. What that does, when you go to probate a will, it's either going to be a dependent or an independent administration. An independent administration lets your executor, once they're appointed, they have those letters testamentary, they can do what they need to do mostly without supervision from the court. They don't have to go get approval every time they need to sell something or deed something over. If it's a dependent administration, they're gonna to have to have everything approved by the court before they can act. And again, that's gonna take longer and cost more money. In general, I think you probably want an independent administration. Uh, I guess the one scenario I could see somebody not wanting that is if you expect there to be a knockdown drag out fight amongst the family, you may want your poor executor to be able to say, look, I can't do anything until the court approves it, right? So that's something to think about there. Uh, it's important to revise your will anytime major life events happen. Uh, in particular, if anybody gets married, if someone gets divorced, if kids are born, and if someone dies. Good idea to revisit that will when something major like that happens. The next document that I want to talk about is called an advanced health care directive. You'll sometimes hear this called a living will. I hate that term because it's not a will and people get confused about what it does or doesn't do, what they have or don't have. 
So we're going to call it an advanced health care directive, which is its actual name. What this is, it's an instruction to your physician that says, I either want or do not want artificial life-sustaining procedures in the event I am diagnosed as terminal or irreversible. So if you think back, I don't know, it's probably been 20 years ago now, the Terry Schiavo case in Florida, remember the woman was on life support and her husband wanted to take her off, her parents wanted to leave her on, huge court battle and it was terrible. This is trying to avoid that. So this makes clear to somebody, do I want artificial life-saving procedures or not? And again, it only comes into play in the limited circumstance that you are terminal or irreversible, okay? And you can select on the form what your wishes are. The one thing I will say on this is you need to not only fill out the form, but you need to have these discussions with your family members. Because what you don't want, right, is a court fight over whether or not they need to turn off your life support machine. And this form can help, but what helps just as much as a family who's all on board and making the same decision. So important decisions to have. This one you can either sign before a notary or you can have two witnesses. So you've got the option there. Uh, it's effective when you are diagnosed, again, as terminal or irreversible. You need to make sure and give a copy to everyone. So your, your spouse, your doctor, your lawyer, uh, anybody who you appoint to make health care decisions for you needs a copy of this form. This is one where there's a freebie. And so what that is, is in the Texas Health and Safety Code, there is a statutory fill-in-the-blank form for the Advanced Health Care Directive. You can, we'll get a link for that. You can go online, print it out, fill in the blanks, have it either witnessed or notarized, and bam, you're done. That can be free. So Advanced Health Care Directive, again, really good way to make your wishes known. Also, a really good way to help uh, confirm for family members who may have to make those difficult decisions that this is what you wanted because you signed it and put it in writing. So that one's an important document. The next thing that we'll talk about is the medical power of attorney. And this one, again, still relates to medical, but it's different. So what a power of attorney does is it lets you appoint an agent to act on your behalf. For a medical power of attorney, the agent can act on your behalf to make medical decisions in the event you're incapacitated. Okay, so this is different, right? This says incapacitated, not terminal or irreversible. So for example, last summer I ended up in a surgery, something went not what they expected, they went to my husband, who was my medical power of attorney, said, what do we do? He made the decision, all right? I wasn't terminal, I wasn't irreversible, but I couldn't tell him what to do. So that's how the medical power of attorney comes into play. Uh, this one, again, you can notarize or you can have it signed by two witnesses. It's effective when your doctor certifies that you are unable to make the decisions and it's only in place while that continues, right? So like once I woke up from my surgery, I'm back in control because I can make my own decisions. Again, we have a statutory form available. All you got to do is go get that, fill in the blanks, get it notarized or witnessed, okay? On the medical power of attorney, here's one where you really need to think about who you're appointing to make these decisions, right? Because uh, I have a friend who talks about that being the executor of someone's estate isn't a gift. I don't think being a medical power attorney is either, right? Because you need to think about who could make the decisions you would want made, especially in what may be really difficult circumstances. So I would just really encourage you, think through carefully who you appoint to be your medical power of attorney. Make sure that they know your wishes. Make sure that they uh, have the strength to do what you would want done. So that is the medical power of attorney. The last of our four key documents is the uh, power of attorney. Same concept here. We're going to have a, a person principal. You're gonna appoint an agent to make decisions for you, but this is gonna be having to do with your assets, right? So managing property, managing your business, managing your finances, okay? Uh, the principal here can select powers and include any limits. So for example, you could say, you know, they're allowed to do everything, but they can't sell any property for example, right? And there's things on the form you can choose yes or no. There's special instructions you can give. So you can really kind of personalize it. This one has to be notarized. You can't use a witness on the power of attorney. And there's a decision you're going to have to make. 
does this document become effective when you sign it or does it only become effective when you become incapacitated? And you have to choose that on the form. So, I mean, for example, I have a cousin who lives overseas. I take care of all of his business in the States. When he signed his power of attorney, he made it effective immediately, right? Because he needs me to be able to do it now. He's alive and well, he's just not here. If you want it only to be effective when a doctor says you're incapacitated, then you need to choose that option, all right? So you have that choice to make. Uh, this is important. This one ends at death or the appointment of a guardian. And we talked about this earlier, but people overlook this. And, you know, if, if somebody's been in the hospital or something and they die, they might go to the bank to get money to pay for the funeral and try to use the power of attorney. They're not going to take that. Because once the person has passed away, the power of attorney is null and void. You have to go through the probate process and get appointed as the uh, administrator or executor for that to work. Again here, we've got a statutory form. Uh, it's in the Texas Probate Code. We'll get a link here. You can print that, fill in the blanks, have it notarized. Okay, so those were the four documents that everybody needs to have. I want to talk about three other documents that you may need. Now, I don't, again, you may need them, you may not. These ones are not one size fits all. So the first thing that I want to talk about is a trust. And I'm just going to tell you now, there are some lawyers, I think, that would tell you that everybody needs a trust. I don't fall in that camp. Because I think that, like a lot of other things, there are some real benefits to trust. There are downsides as well. And I just think this is something that you need to think about. The one exception to that is if you have minor children or special needs adult children, you need a trust, right? Uh, so we've got two little kids. If something happens to me and my husband, everything goes into a trust. Okay, so it's not set up now, but it's going to be a testamentary trust. Uh, that's a scenario where you absolutely need it. Beyond that, I think there are sure benefits and scenarios where you might want them. Just beware of any lawyer that says every client needs a trust. I don't think that that's accurate. If they can explain to you why you need one, great. All right, so what is a trust, right? We hear that thrown around a lot. Essentially, a trust is just creating a separate legal entity, all right? And the person who sets that up is called the settlor. So if I'm going to create a trust, I'm the settlor, okay? I am going to create this legal entity, put my assets in it, then I'm going to appoint someone to be the trustee. They're going to manage those assets. They're going to make all the decisions. And then I'm going to appoint someone who gets the benefit of the assets. That's called the beneficiary. So kid example is the easiest, I think, right? If I decide, okay, I'm going to set up a trust for my kids, right? If I die, everything goes into a trust, separate entity. Let's say my dad is the trustee. He's going to manage the assets. He decides how we invest things, when the kids get distributions, how much they get. And all the benefits there, all the money goes to the kids, but my dad's the one that doles it out, okay? Instead of, you know, a five-year-old being in charge of the entire estate, okay? So that's sort of how that works. And you can set that up in a variety of different contexts. Uh, the trustee has to manage those assets according to the settlor's instructions, right? So what the trust says he has to do, and then also in line with certain legal and fiduciary duties. So there's, there's you know, rules on what the trustee can and can't do, that sort of thing. Uh, you can set that up kind of however you want, right? So uh, again, for minor kids, sometimes you'll see, well, the trust is in place until they're 18. I don't love that because how many smart 18-year-olds do you know, right? Maybe it's better off to have 25. Or uh, I've seen somewhere it says the trust is in place until someone graduates from college and then they can get their money outright, sort of a thing. So lots of ways to set that up. Uh, when the trust ends or the duties are complete um, or the settlor um, sort of says, okay, when this happens, it'll end, that's when the trust will wrap up. It will be distributed. It will no longer be held by the trust. Those assets would go to the beneficiaries. So a couple different types of trust. There's a, a testamentary trust or an inter vivos trust. A, a testamentary trust is one that's created at death. A lot of times you'll see that written into a will. Uh, and essentially when someone dies, this becomes effective. The trust is created. That's what I said I had for my kids. Uh, it does not fund until the death occurs and the probate process you know, proves the funding of the money. Uh, it's funded by the executor with the settlor's assets. So in the trust, you would say what assets you want to be put in there. That's how the testamentary one occurs. 
inter vivos is also called a living trust, and you would create that, obviously, while you're living, okay? Uh, the settler creates it and gets to choose, is it a revocable trust or an irrevocable trust? All right, and so there's pros and cons to both of those. A revocable trust, obviously, you can change or take back if you don't like it, okay? And that still gets the assets into the trust. That gets you limited liability because you don't own them anymore, right? So again, if somebody sues over something, sues the trust, your personal assets are protected. Uh, it does get it out of your name in general, right? But if it's revocable, there are some trust protections you don't get. So for example, on a revocable trust, that's still considered part of your estate for estate taxes, likely, because you could go in and pull it right back out. Uh, may still be considered part of your estate for Medicaid, those sorts of things. You got to look at that. There's more protections for an irrevocable trust because obviously once you put it in there, it's in there, you can't get it out, right? Uh, and so the, some of the protections that we talked about may be available there. So you have to make that decision. Again, I do that in conjunction with an attorney. Uh, again, remember, property in a trust doesn't go through the probate process because it's, it's a non-probate asset. It's still owned by the trust. So that's something else to keep in mind. That may be another benefit. Uh, when are trusts beneficial? When should you think about using one? If you need to provide for and protect a beneficiary, again, minor children, special needs children, uh, or special needs adults. If you've got a scenario where you just don't think that the person can manage the money, right? They're, they don't make good financial decisions or they've got creditors out the wazoo, right? Maybe we put it in the trust where they can't do something dumb with those assets. Uh, there can be flexibility of asset distribution in there. So you can write that out where the, the tr person you choose to be trustees can make you know, decisions about what to do there. You can avoid the probate process. We talked about that. If you need to avoid estate tax liability, an irrevocable trust could be a good option to do that as well. Uh, potentially to avoid creditor issues. Now there's some limits there. If you're creating the trust after you already know you've got creditors after you, that may not work. But if you want to create that, your creditors may be unable to uh, reach that. Privacy, right? One thing is since this doesn't go through the probate process, none of this is public record. Whereas if you have to file your will in probate and file an affidavit uh, with you know, all your inventory, now that's public record. So for some people that can be a real concern. It can allow for professional management of property. Sometimes you'll see people put assets into a trust and the trustee is a bank or a, a credit union. You'll see like professional, you got professional people managing those assets for the benefit of your uh, beneficiaries. There could be potential tax benefits to using a trust. Again, that's going to be dependent on a lot of things you'll need to talk about with your accountant to see if that would be beneficial to you. Okay, next up let's talk about the out-of-hospital DNR. Again, a form that some people may need, certainly not everyone. Uh, so a DNR is a do not resuscitate order. And essentially what this form is, is it's a declaration to people outside of hospital employees. So EMS or uh, nursing home or you know, people that you do not want resuscitation measures to be taken. The ones specifically listed are CPR, transcutaneous cardiac pacing, I think that's right, I did not go to medical school, defibrillation, advanced airway management, and artificial ventilation. So again, if it's somebody like me, right, if I conk my head and need CPR, we need to get cracking. If I'm somebody who is on hospice or who is extremely old and just doesn't want to be hooked up to machines, this is where we would need the out-of-hospital DNR. Uh, this one has to be signed by two witnesses or notif notarized, and it has to be signed by a physician. So you have to make this decision in conjunction with a doctor, and they have to sign off on it, be given the decision that you're making. Um, it needs to be readily accessible if you need it. So if you have someone who has an out-of-hospital DNR, you may need to like le legit tape it to the front door. Because what I'll tell you happens is if EMS gets called and it's not right there, they have to get, you know, they have to intubate the person or they have to start CPR. Uh, and again, this is one of those scenarios where you need to communicate with your family what your wishes are. Especially you can't find that DNR, somebody screaming, save them, save them. That's what they're going to have to do. So again, some things to think about there. There's a statutory form that's available here. It's going to be found in the Texas Administrative Code. Uh, you can print that off. We'll have a link for that. 
uh, but do keep in mind it does have to be done in consultation with your doctor and then uh, either notarized or signed by two witnesses. Okay, so then the last document that some people may need is a document providing for child care for minor children or for adults with special needs. A lot of times you'll see these documents that are kind of rolled into the will, and that's part of the will, but you may need to have a separate document sort of depending on the situation. You want to make sure that you uh, have in there both uh, appointment of someone to take care of the, the person, as far as a guardian goes, you'll also need to appoint a conservator that will take care of the financial aspects. They may be one and the same, but there's sort of two different duties there you want to make sure that you spell out. So again, not everybody's going to need that. It may be part of your will, or it may need to be a separate document. Just make sure that's something that you've addressed in those documents. <laughs>